Good morning. Um, I'd like to say thank you, first of all, to O'Reilly and Ed for arranging this fantastic conference, not just because of the weather, but um, thank you for the weather, uh, but also to have so many people from so many different parts of this incredible field all in one place. And it feels to me like it's the first time that's ever happened. So I think we're all really lucky, lucky to be here. So um, I'm a news editor at The Guardian. I have one of those jobs, though, that I don't know if any of you have a job that you have difficulty explaining to your parents what you do. But um, my job is really like that. I've, I've, my background is as a news editor, as a journalist. Um, but my first day on the news desk was September the 10th, 2001. And so my career has kind of been bookended by um, the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan, and also by handling kind of huge amounts of data. So what I'm going to do uh, is talk a bit about what we do with data, and particularly how we had to handle one very large and quite controversial set. So this is the, the very first Guardian from May 1821. Um, the paper was four pages uh, long, and if the advertising uh, recession continues, that's probably how long we'll be in the future. But um, uh, in those days, ads were on the front. Uh, it was led by an ad for a lost black Labrador. And um, news was on the back. And there, a big third of the page was taken up with a table, a table of data, essentially. It was uh, school's data from Manchester. It was a list of every school with how much was spent on it and how many pupils they had. Now, at the time, the official data was really bad. It was essentially it was compiled by the people who ran the schools. They had an interest in it. It was partial. And this was sent in by somebody who had the knowledge to collect the data. But they wanted to do it, and I'm paraphrasing what they said in the piece, but essentially because if we don't know what the condition of society is, how can things get any better? And um, we moved on a little bit in the way we present information now. This is something uh, which we do, and it's uh, basically it's a guide to public spending in Britain by every government department. You have something kind of similar here called Death and Taxes, I think, which is just a fantastic resource. Um, now, if we were based in the States, I guess we could ring up the Treasury and get a spreadsheet with all that data on. But unfortunately, it doesn't really happen like that. Being the UK, every government department uh, provides the information separately. They all publish it as PDFs, of course, which is a particularly useless format. And um, what we have to do is we have to go through the PDFs, extract the data, and they've just made it more complicated by putting in this kind of accountancy speak. And they split the spending into different types of spending and so on. It's just really tedious. And we have to go through it, and then we have to... Um, Think, well, what are we missing? So, for instance, the Ministry of Defence budget didn't include spending on operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. And we want to know what that was. It's kind of obvious. It's public information. It's approved by Parliament. We should all know about it. So I had to ring at the press office and pull the whole, I work for the Guardian, can you give me the figures thing. Press office didn't know. A couple of days later, after a bit of nagging, they come back with the numbers, which is it's ridiculous, especially in a country which is supposed to be on a kind of transparency um, high at the moment, with government pushing out uh, uh, public data sets. So anyway, behind that uh, graphic lives a spreadsheet, lives in a, a huge amount of data. And what we thought was, what if we just started pushing that data out into the world and just said to people, what can you do with it? Um, so essentially, it's about what we do with the data blog. is really about enabling that data to live for more than a moment. We publish data sets using Google Spreadsheets, partly because it's just incredibly easy to share. We um, also encourage our users to do visualizations. We've got a really active Flickr group. Uh, there's a guy called David McCandless, Information is Beautiful, some of you might know, who started um, producing stuff on our Flickr group. We gave him some blog posts, he wrote a book, and, um, and now he's, he's made it in a kind of world which is starting to become a place where we can all start to work with data and start to play with it. And um, so what we did was we set up something called Guardian KUK slash data, and we've got a data blog as part of that. Uh, we've uh, encouraged our users to kind of come up with stuff. We encourage users to come up with stories as well and tell us what to do with the data. I suppose part of it is this idea that in the past, journalists we would sit in our ivory towers and we would kind of produce content or data essentially. And we would throw it out into the world for it to be kind of gratefully received. It's a very one way process. And um, now what we've realized is that um, it's much more of a two way process. There are people out there who know much, much more about the stories than we do, have got much better ideas, and perhaps better ideas how to visualize it and how to do stuff with it. And we can gain from that, and we can learn from that. And that's where this comes from. And also, it's about kind of collecting information. I mean, that graphic I showed you earlier about public spending. Every time we do that, we get two or three calls from government departments asking if they can have a copy of it, because they don't have the information, including the central office of information, which is slightly concerning. Um, 
So the other thing we've done is we kind of broadened out as well into um, trying to become a kind of central point for data. So we offer now, besides the data sets that we publish, um, we update, we also do these data searches. So the one on the left is the kind of world government data search. And what we saw was all these places around the world, states and cities and countries that were pushing out open data. We thought, wouldn't it be great if you had one place and you could search all those data sets? So that's essentially what it does. You go in there and you type in, say, crime or something, you get results back from Australia, New Zealand, data.gov, California, London, and so on. And um, we've got about 80% of world open government data sites, and we're adding more all the time. And the one on the right is the new one we launched, which is basically aid and global development data, um, which is so it searches the UN and the World Bank and the IMF. And those kind of places. So you can search for you know, aid to Pakistan and Haiti and, and see how they compared, which um, uh, somebody has done for us, and it produced a great story. So I suppose increasingly what we've started dealing with are very, very big data sets. And, and this one here is a piece we did. We got every government item of spending over £25,000 published by the UK government by department. So what they did is they shoved out about 180 spreadsheets into one thing, which is kind of you know, difficult for people to work with. So we just aggregated the whole lot by department. And we started to look at, you know, who the big companies were that were getting all, all the money. Because in the UK, it's quite an unusual new trend. That actually, government spending is really being carried out on the ground by big corporations. And um, you can see this graphic here. This shows all the, uh, the companies that get government money. The big one in the middle is a company called Capita, which got four and a half billion quid, which is quite a lot. But one of the more useful things we did was set up this explorer, this guy called Matt Wall, who's a fantastic developer at The Guardian. And what this explorer does is allows people to search all the data and filter it. And, you know, it's not beautiful. It's not particularly, um, you know, difficult to understand. It's just very, very easy to use. So you could search for um, nuclear or military or cheese. If you search for cheese, something comes up. And then download the stuff as CSV files. And the reason we did that was we thought, well, what if we just put it out there and ask people to help us generate stories and see what they could come up with? And people did. We got about 10 or 15 good stories for the paper and for the news site out of people out there looking at something they're interested in. One person thought, well, I wonder how much is spent on flag flying. They typed in flag flying. And it, um, they found that one department is responsible for all flag flying in the UK. They spent £150,000 last year, which is perhaps why you don't see that many flags flying in the UK. So... This is, I guess, has been the big game changer for um, data journalism in the last year. And I think a lot of the stories we've had to handle have been enhanced by having kind of data journalistic skills, by being able to handle a spreadsheet. But I think with the WikiLeaks stories, if it hadn't been for data journalism, we wouldn't have got those stories and we wouldn't have been able to tell the incredible tales that came out of the data. Um, so, I mean, it started for me in uh, early summer this year can't say exactly when, when um, one of the investigative reporting team came down and said, so we've got a bit of a spreadsheet, you're quite good with spreadsheets, aren't you? So I went upstairs and to this little bunker room where everybody was hiding out, and there were four or five incredibly bright, brilliant investigative reporters, none of whom had ever used a spreadsheet before in their lives. And um, in front of them, they had the first of these releases, which is the Afghanistan WikiLeaks release. It was 92,000 rows. First problem was that they were all using Excel 2003, which cuts off at 60,000... 100 something rows, so, so everything was a suspiciously round number for a while. And um, I guess they were there, what this kind of put in concrete for us was that there were two things we had to do. There were two faces to this. There was a face of this data that we would put out there to the world and show people stories. But we also had to find ways of making that data easier for our reporters to navigate so they could generate stories. Um, so... This is the first kind of big story we got out of the Afghanistan data. You can see straight away from the, from the anecdotal evidence we knew, the IED attacks. Does everybody know what an IED is? Basically a hole in the ground, somebody puts a whole load of explosives in and um, you know, blows up somebody who's going past. And they're very, very deadly, very hard to detect, and, it, and their use has kind of massively increased. It's become the big feature of the war in Afghanistan. So we realized that, so we filtered out the data, and um, we started to have a look at what it showed us. And I'll show you, this is actually, I've got the, um, the WikiLeaks spreadsheet. Or well, this is a filter of it, because the whole lot would crash this machine. So basically, what you see, what we had there, which is the handy thing, is we had very, very structured data. Every item had a ID number. It was a date and a time. They were all categorized and subcategorized. 
as tracking number, a title, and a summary. And the summary was the bit in English. This incident here on the 4th of January is the first incident recorded in 2004 as an IED attack. Um, you've got where it happened, and there were kind of uh, casualty numbers. A lot of these were, weren't very accurately filled in. I mean, the thing about the database is it's, it's based on something called SIG Acts, which significant actions. And this data set has been available to kind of academics here, I believe, for a while to kind of investigate on an anonymous basis. But it's the first time we've had access to it. And there are problems with it. If you're on the ground and you're in action, you're probably not necessarily going to stop to fill in a spreadsheet. But um, either way, there's incredible data there. You know, you've got a latitude and longitude and MGRS, which is the military coordinate system and so on. So what we had there was something really, really structured. And what it told us, let's go back to this, was how these things are spread. So every dot on that map shows an IED attack, an explosion, just an explosion. There are another 8,000 odd which were found and um, cleared away. Um, and you can see these incredible patterns. So if you see there's a uh, Kandahar, the road to Kandahar to Kabul is dotted with these things. Imagine if you're driving down that road every day. You might feel a little nervous because you would know that you're, you're at risk. And the south, which is where uh, originally British forces were and now um, the Marines are, is um, particularly targeted. And you can see on the, the right-hand side, we can show um, how, how the attacks have increased. Now, this went in the newspaper because, you know, we have the space and we can do something which is beautiful, but it's flat, and that's all it is. On the site, we could do something else. And so um, there's a guy called Alistair Dan, who's a fantastic flash engineer who works for The Guardian, who did this because we've got the time and we've got the location. So suddenly you can start plotting how these things developed over time. And you can see from 2004 right the way 2009, how it became a feature of the war. So it's, it's two ways of doing the same thing, but in different formats. And increasingly, that's what we're starting to do. We're starting to get the same data and thinking, well, we can display it one way on the paper, one way on the site. So on Iraq, the big story was slightly different. There were many more records, 391,000 incidents with Iraq. And uh, we kind of thought, well, how can we do it? So there were two approaches, one of which is quite classy, which is this one, which basically took one day one day in Iraq, this is October 2006, I think, and showed every incident that happened. And the interesting thing about this data is we've been told repeatedly that it didn't have casualty data. They don't do casualty counts. And now we found that they did. And we had casualty data, and we could see what was happening when. So we did two things. We did this, which is kind of the classy approach. And then I kind of did a slightly quicker and dirtier approach where we broke down all the data so we could work out how many IED attacks there were, how many people were murdered. Uh, many more people were murdered in Iraq in the sectarian violence than died in IED attacks. Some like 34,000 people were murdered, 33,000 people died in IED attacks. I mean, it's incredible numbers of people. You can't imagine that group of people in one place. And we bunked a whole lot in Google Fusion Tables, which is fantastic. So I don't know if there's somebody here from uh, Fusion Tables, but it's just, thank you, it's just a brilliant tool for just mapping huge amounts of data very, very quickly. Um, and all this is, all this shows, is every dot shows an incident where somebody died. And as you move out, you get these incredible patterns of, of just, you know, awfulness, obviously. Um, but it also shows you a lot about the war and what happened and where and how Baghdad was a center of all this violence and so on. And any ideas about which was most popular out of the two? It was the second. It was the fact that, I think it was the fact that people could, were in control of the data. They could move around it, they could see how it worked, and they could see how it fits together. That tells us something very interesting, I think. That the data now is something that we want to be in control of and in charge of. And we want to give people the kind of the ability to explore it for themselves. Two minute warning. Okay, so um, this is the third release. This is a completely different kettle of fish, the cables. What we got was essentially a massive, unstructured text file, um, which we had a developer spending about a month and a half trying to put in some sort of structure. And the fact was, there is stuff you could read through it, you'd have that you could kind of separate it out. So this is a cable about Egypt and the um, Egypt's strategic importance to the US, uh, which is a briefing for General Schwartz sent in 2009. And it took us a while to work out that you have stuff there which is common to all the cables. Every cable is tagged with keywords, which could be acronyms like PTR was Prevention of Terrorism and so on. And every cable had a heading and a subject and so on. And with all of these data sets, we realized we weren't going to publish the whole lot with any of them. With the uh, Afghanistan release, we published all the ID attacks. With the Iraq release, we published all the um, instances where somebody died, but without the summary field, so that we wouldn't put any like, we didn't want to name people, we didn't have people's names. And with this data, we're only publishing about 700 or so cables. 
And so online, we kind of decided to give people a breakdown of what the cables were. And this just shows, you know, this particular set of cables came from a project called Cipronet, which was a very specific project. And it shows wh where the senders were and how they were sent. A lot of these cables were marked confidential, but apparently, um, the way the system works, there are around 4 million people in the world who can see cables marked confidential. I don't know how secret a secret is that's kept by 4 million people. Um, and you can see exactly where this project's cables came from. And online, what we get, did was give people a way to navigate and negotiate around the cables we've downloaded. But we also gave people the metadata. So for every cable, all 251,000 cables, we gave the date and the time that it was sent, the location of the sender, and the tag, so people would do some work on it. I suppose what this all kind of comes to, and where this all kind of comes to for us, is that a lot of what this is about is about the power of stories, about the power of storytelling. You know, people talk about the internet killing journalism and killing traditional reporting, but what we'd found was actually it enhanced it for us. We had traditional reporters who were specialists and knew Afghanistan, knew Iraq really well, and we had the data on one side, and our job was to bring it together so that you could have people just telling great stories. This guy here, this guy called James Cameron, and why he didn't direct Avatar, he was the reason I wanted to become a journalist. He's a fantastic Guardian journalist from the 50s and 60s. Um, he covered Korea, he covered Vietnam. And I guess what, he's, what he did was he told brilliant stories. So what he's saying here is that, um, you know, essentially there are questions in the future that we'll, we'll only have the answer to because only computers can tell us. And it's true, in the sense that what we do we're doing because we can only get those answers by knowing the questions to ask the computer to tell us in the first place. So what I'm saying is that, you know, you can see this year data has changed the world, and WikiLeaks has changed the world, whether we like it or not, for good or for ill, and this data journalism has helped that process happen. Thank you very much.